Hello, my name is Suzanne Stanis, and I'm Vice President of Education for Indiana Landmarks, and I'm also a member of the Preserving Historic Places Conference Planning Committee. This is our last virtual session before our full conference, September 27th through the 29th. Online registration remains open until September 16th, and we have a great lineup of speakers, informational ses sessions and workshops, and uh, a great behind the scenes tour of Tippy Canoe Place, the former Studebaker Mansion, and some private homes along Washington Street. So we hope you'll take a look at the conference website to see the agenda and pricing and join us in South Bend. I'm really excited about us being back in person after a two year hiatus. So that's gonna be a real highlight, I think, for a lot of us. I wanna thank my co-administrators for the conference and our virtual lectures. Jeannie Regan-Denius, who has helped throughout the planning process, has moved from the Division of Historic Preservation and Archaeology to the Crown Hill Cemetery Foundation in Indianapolis. But she assures me that she'll be in South Bend and everyone will get to, to visit with her. Danielle Kaufman is our new DHPA conference representative. And for those of you who are not familiar with Danielle's work at DHPA, we look forward to introducing her in South Bend. Eric Sandweiss is chair of the Indiana University Committee on Historic Preservation, and Jessica Kramer from Indiana Landmarks keeps everything running smoothly with her logistical and technology skills. And of course, a huge thanks for generous financial support from our funders who keep our registration fee among the lowest in preservation conferences. Our partners include the Indiana Division of Historic Preservation and Archaeology, Indiana Landmarks, Indiana University and the St. Joseph County Commissioners. Our partners or our sponsors include RC Engineers, Cardno, now Stantec, City of South Bend, Cornelius O'Brien Lecture Series, Cressy Commercial Real Estate, Indiana Housing Community and Development Authority, Marvin Windows, the National Park Service, SJCA, and Visit South Bend Mishawaka. Supporters, Berglund, Cultural Resource Analyst, H.G. Chrisman Construction, Historic Preservation and Heritage Consulting, the Indiana Archaeology Council, Old National Bank, Ratio Architects, R.E. Diamond Associates, and West Janney Elsner Associates. We're using the webinar version of Zoom today, so attendees' microphones are muted and video is hidden, although Vicki's asked me to keep my face on screen so she'll feel like she's talking to somebody. So please submit your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. I'll be moderating and asking the questions as time allows at the end. The session is being recorded and will be available shortly after the presentation. So what better topic to kick off a trip to South Bend than the inspiring story of the restoration of the Studebaker Electric Fountain. We hope you'll take time to see it during in person during the conference. And behind every transformational project is a tireless person who takes the lead on fundraising, promotion, scheduling, and gives those pep talks during slow times and setbacks. With the Studebaker Foundation, that dynamo is Vicki McIntyre. Vicki is a community leader who stepped up to chair the Friends of the Studebaker Fountain and bring the community together to transform this important landmark. Vicki will provide us with a look at what it took to accomplish the project and its ongoing maintenance work. She's joined by Todd Zeiger, director of the Northern Regional Office of Indiana Landmarks located in South Bend. In addition to Todd's work at Indiana Landmarks, he is an adjunct professor in the University of Notre Dame's Architecture, Historic Preservation, Concentration, and Master's programs, where he teaches research, history, theory, and practice. Todd has a special affinity for the Studebaker Corporation. In his spare time, he is restoring a 1939 Studebaker truck. So thanks, Todd and Vicki, and we'll turn it over to Vicki. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. Thank you for being here. Todd is still figuring out where I am here, but this is a story of the magnificent Studebaker Fountain. It is magnificent. And the story is long and involved. And those of you who have done a lot of restoration certainly know how that goes. Lots of ups, lots of downs. So I hope what you're seeing now is our fountain. 
that in. Okay. Todd, Todd, we're still we're in the presentation speaker mode. Sorry, technical problems, which is there, what we there. had constantly. How's that? There we go. Thank you. Now, where are my notes? <clears throat> Got any notes for me? Oh, this ought to be original. What? Well, as he's uh, trying to find my notes, this could be very original as I make up things as we go. <laughs> oh, we have no doubt that you know this project backwards and forwards. So <laughs> don't uh... for me to stay on uh, chronicle or order because I keep skipping around. You're right. I do know way too much. <laughs> uh, so can we go to the second slide maybe now that they've seen the first one? So when I first heard about this fountain, all we had to look at were postcards. Um, and the first slide you saw was part of one of the postcards. There were lots and lots of pictures, uh, but not any kind of detail of what it was or what happened. And so we almost had to start from the beginning. But as we went through, we learned a lot of the history and the history turned out to be John Studebaker. It was all about John Studebaker and the Studebaker Company. In 1876, John Studebaker took his fancy wagon uh, to the Philadelphia Exposition. And uh, there he saw J.L. Mott, who brought his fabulous fountain. He didn't order it then or anything, but he had a chance to at least look at it. And it must have um, inspired him because the word was that he was smitten with it. Can you get on that number two? There we go. Nope, there it is. I oh, love we're, this. We're still, sorry, we're still not seeing the images. Oh, shoot. I'm so sorry. That's all right, we'll get them there. Okay, you guys go get a drink of water, have a drink. <laughs> How about now? Are you seeing anything now? Not yet. Get over here. You can get over there and work. That's all right. The joys of Zoom. We've all been there. I was working on it. I'm in it. Okay, we can see the speaker format. There you go. Does that work? Okay, are we back in business? We are, thank you. Okay, so now you're looking at a cartoon, right? A cartoon of John Studebaker uh, on his wagon with the fabulous fountain drawn in the back. And, uh, like always, by the way, everything in the postcards, they drew what they want, wanted the water to look like. But in this cartoon, as you can see, it said, um, uh, John Studebaker, whose heart is overflowing with good impulse, generous deeds, and devotion to South Bend. How good can you get, right? Uh, so in it's 1876, John took this wagon, which is, by the way, still in our uh, Studebaker Museum. And it's got a red ribbon on it and everything. He took it and off he went to the exposition. The fountain picture that you'll see next is the one that was uh, shown at the exposition. If you look at it, and if you know our fountain, you can see that it's very, very pretty. It's very grand. It was 25 feet tall, 42 feet in diameter, but it's not like ours. It has no dolphins, no turtles, and no light bulbs hanging from it. That's a different part of the story. 
uh, John was very smitten with electricity. And he wanted Studebaker to stop building gas cars and start building nothing but electric cars. So when he saw this fountain, he must have thought, yeah, I gotta have it, but he didn't order it then. Uh, he, uh, let's see, let's look at this. So it was in, uh, what is it, uh, 1902, that's four years before our fountain arrived, he rolled out his electric car. And here it is with Thomas Edison and John Studebaker. Now, electricity was around back then, of course. Uh, a lot of the houses had it, but certainly not all of them. Uh, a lot of businesses had it, but it was still pretty much unknown. Here's another picture of the fountain as it was presented at the uh, exposition, and it was called the gem of the exposition. This is a little booklet that we found in the museum. It's the same picture of the fountain, um, and this was the fountain that uh, was just kind of drawn. I mean, that's not the real fountain at all. That was just the drawn version of what they thought it should look like. So uh, he ordered, John ordered the fountain. We don't know for sure, but we think he paid about $10,000 for it, which back then was about what you'd pay for an average home. And the fountain arrived on a great big, huge train, we understand. And so here we are in 1906. I love this with the guys with their shovels. Look over in the left-hand corner. Those have to be the bosses. They're standing away. They're not, they don't have a shovel in their hand. Absolutely. I can't even imagine putting this fountain in with nothing but shovels. Uh, hopefully they had something else, but I don't know what it was. Certainly when we recreated it and they brought it back, they had more equipment out there, bigger equipment than you'd ever see in your life. So it was put in Howard Park, not where it is today, but in Howard Park. Here's another, as I call it, the big dig by hand. Another picture, same ideas. So this is our very, very famous postcard. This is what you could send to your friends to brag about what we had. Uh, it, this was, it arrived in 1906 and it was put in Howard Park. Thousands of people came to the unveiling. Being electrified back then, as I said, was a very big deal. So we had a hydroelectric power station and the remnants of which is, are still down around Century Center. You can still see the turbine pits at the head gates, which control the flow. So John uh, looked at all this crowd, all his people had arrived, and he told them, I've traveled the world. And what I saw in every successful town was a marvelous monument or a fountain. And I wanted South Bend to have that because South Bend is going to be a famous, famous city. So I have brought this for you. And he, he said, I'm not much into speeches. And I think he spoke for an hour. <laughs> so uh, he said, you know, parks are most visited when they're very attractive. An electric fountain will do that. But one of the things I want you to know, I'm a big advocate of matrimony. And I want those men, our young boys, to get out of the bars. And I want them to come and watch the fountain and feel the beauty of it. So I have put benches around the fountain guaranteed to hold the heftiest sweetie. I don't think you could say that today. <laughs> 
So this will keep the young men from frequenting those saloons. You will see in the later pictures, we have almost the same benches. And I guess they too could hold, but we won't say that. <laughs> Fortunately, we get a lot of people visiting plus ducks or geese. This is Vicky, another- Vicki, if you could go back to that, sorry to interrupt, but uh, it, we've had people ask what that um, feature is that's in the back left. It looks kind yeah, of like we, a cage. We spent a lot of time asking about that too. Do you know what that is? Yeah, here, I was gonna answer. Sorry, Todd, we couldn't hear you. Oh, shoot. It's a structural support for a natural gas tank that used to be there. That's all it is. Does that make sense? Okay. But we did the same thing. We asked everybody and very few people knew. Maybe I first learned that from Todd. So here's another view of the fountain after it arrived. Another famous postcard without the people. You can't see the benches. Again, the water is drawn in. They wanted to make the water appear higher uh, and larger. It is kind of funny and I may have to go back to that one. So, uh, no, I'll, I'll get there. I'm sorry, I hate people that do this. Um, so, what happened then is after uh, I learned about the fountain, I went to, I called, first I called Brandon Anderson at the History Museum. And he said, yeah, we think we have some pieces of the fountain. They're over in uh, the old Studebaker warehouse in the corner. He said, we got them quite a while ago, but we, you know, we can't raise the money to restore the fountain. Our, porches falling off of Kopshom. So we have to raise the money for that. So that's not possible. So uh, I said, well, can I see them? So I went with a friend over and we saw them. And what I learned was there, they were literally thrown to the corner. And as you can see on this next, we'll come back to this slide. Uh, they have been painted pink, blue, yellow, white, I mean, they were really pretty gross, uh, but and I thought ruined. I thought, oh my God, they have ruined this, these features. Later, I learned that they actually protected them. So we learned then that what had happened is when they tore the fountain down in 1942, because it had fallen into disrepair, the war was on, everybody thought that the fountain had been melted down and uh, sold for scrap for the war effort. Uh, but apparently the Siler family rescued what you see. So the top bowl, the lady on top, three of the dolphins and two turtles. And they put it in their putt-putt golf course. Um, it stayed there for quite a while. The golf course went out of business and they moved it to their backyard and that's what you're looking at now is the backyard on Jefferson Street and they made it into a little white pool around it. Those were never the original walls. It was much bigger, but they put in a little, looks like a kid's swimming pool. And there it stayed. When mom and dad died, the kids then donated it to the History Museum. But the History Museum, as I said, didn't know what to do with it. They put it in the corner of Kevin Smith's warehouse and pretty much forgot about it. They weren't quite sure even what they had. The Siler family apparently told them, we think it's part of the Studebaker Fountain, but nobody really knew for sure. So I called Brandon Anderson. We went over and saw the pieces. We started doing some research and Brandon said, I don't think there's any doubt about it. We've got this parts of the Studebaker Fountain. And then when I saw the postcards, I thought, man, we got to restore this thing. And so, First of all, we formed a small committee. If Joe Broden is on, she was part of that small committee. I met with Todd Zeiger for one, and we tried to figure out what to do next. 
we started raising money a little, but I didn't know what I was doing. And so that wasn't working out well. Um, but we started looking for people to restore it. We had to figure out how much this was gonna cost. We found McKay Lodge Fine Arts Conservation Lab in Oberlin, Ohio. And they became our primary restorers. And this is a picture of Tom and Emmett when they came to pick up the pieces. And they are the ones who said for the first time, this fountain is in pretty good shape. Uh, there are toes broken and there's, uh, you know, uh, dings in the thing, but on the whole, it's something that we can restore. Now, when they really got into it, they found that in an effort to save the fountain, and because we didn't know what we were doing, apparently in 19, before 1942, they cut the heads off the features and poured in cement. Well, you can imagine that was not a good thing. Cement expanded and cracked. And that was not the way to handle that. So Tom Podner and McKay Lodge became our experts. They then uh, met with our committee, told us that the features are actually made of zinc. It was thought it was pot metal, but it isn't. It's zinc. And the big bowl and the walls, the, both bowls, are made of cast iron. Um, they did some research and said, it looks like if you restore it, you'll have the largest and most complete Studebaker fountain in the country. Well, that was exciting. That's a reason to start, right? So uh, I wanted it to go back at Howard Park. We campaign, we sign petitions, uh, we tried to get them to, to locate it in Howard, but they had planned a really, a, almost a kid's paradise for Howard Park. And they said, no, I'll tell you what, if you raise enough money, we'll put it in Leaper Park. And I, I, you know, we'll even sign a contract. So they gave us a contract they'd worked on and worked on that went on and on about how if we raised, if we couldn't raise enough money, the money we had would go to the park foundation, it would go to here, it would go, it was almost two full pages of what would happen when we didn't raise enough money because they were sure we couldn't. And one last little paragraph at the bottom said, if you do raise enough money and bring the fountain to South Bend, we will install it in Leaper Park and maintain it completely at our full expense. Man, I hung on that paragraph for a long time. So um, I had no idea how to raise money. You guys all know, I'm sure. I didn't have any idea. I met with Todd Zeiger and I kept saying, what do I do, what do I do? So my friend called me and said, I'll tell you what, Vicki, we'll run a, an article in the paper. I'll put pictures and everything. And I'll say, if people want to donate, they should contact you. So we did, or at least I said, okay, that's great. In the meantime, I ran over to talk to Jim Small at Notre Dame, who's in charge of all the fundraising and really knows what he's doing. He said, oh my God, you can't do that. That's the worst thing you can do. You have to start out with your heavy hitters. You ought to tell the big donors that you'll put their name around the wall. I thought, oh, I want to do that. But he said, you'll never get anything. If you do that, you've ruined any hope of fundraising. So after I was absolutely devastated, knew I'd screwed it up, I called, tried to get the article pulled, and they said, sorry, it's running tomorrow. So run it did. And two days later, I got an email that said, we would like to donate to the Studebaker Fountain. We have retired here from Hawaii. I thought, yes, yeah, sure, everybody does, you know? I thought, oh, I'm really being put on, but oh well. So I wrote back and I said, well, here's our 501c3 information. We will look forward to hearing from you. And I heard nothing. So I wrote back and I said, you know, I hope you're still interested in donating to the fountain. And I get back, you will be receiving a check from our donor designated fund for $75,000. <laughs> I 
Oh, yeah, right. They have really putting me on now. So I thought, I'll get them. I write back and I said, oh, how wonderful. We'd love to take you to lunch. How about such and such a time at Cafe Navarre and everything? I get back. We like lunch. So I called up my treasurer and I said, would you meet me down at Cafe Navarre on this date? They're not going to show up. There isn't any such thing. So about three days before the lunch, I get a phone call from her that says, oh, my God, I just got a check for $75,000. I said, oh, for heaven's sakes, run. Don't stop. Run to the bank. So she ran to the bank. We showed up for lunch. The Rask family, Mr. and Mrs. Rask, who turned out to be positively lovely, had indeed retired here from Hawaii. The check was good. We had the best lunch ever. It was just delightful. So that gave me the, the start for my uh, fundraising. Then we were almost legitimate. Then we had to fight for a location. This is where it ended up, thank heaven. The duck pond was over to the left and they finally removed the duck pond. They kept wanting to put us in the duck pond because that would be much easier and cheaper. But we finally ended up with this design and it is lovely. The fountain is featured right in the middle as it should be. Uh, they have updated and refreshed the park, which looks wonderful. They have an overlook out there that, where you can feed the ducks. It is now a beautiful park featuring the fountain. So needless to say, we, that was the start of our fundraising. We did manage to uh, raise the money. Our first budget, I think, was $283,000 or something like that. It, it you know, we uh, were allowed to add and count the $125,000 it will cost the city to install it. Uh, you know, the RAS turned out to be our biggest donor, although other people in the community were extremely great, uh, generous. And another donor at 100,000, several at 40,000 and 50,000. So, uh, I mean, I was just plain lucky. That was also at a time when the stock market was flying and people were, were washing money. Now I wouldn't be so lucky, I'm quite sure. So this is Tom Podner uh, from McKay Lodge. Uh, fire firing our column and getting that ready to go. And this, oh, did I tell you we found all the original molds in a company in Alabama, Alabama Iron. What had happened, um, apparently when J.L. Mott went out of business in New York, this company bought up all the molds and it's now being run by Luke Robinson, his grandson. Uh, we went down to visit and you walk in and around at the top of the, the huge room is just molds, just hanging, hanging, hanging. So except for the boy on dolphin, all the original molds were there and they said, yes, indeed, they could recreate our fountain. They would do, so we had, uh, we're gonna go back. Let's go back, to, I'll show you what we had again. So, the surviving elements. So all we had were that column, the small bowl, the lady on top, three of the boys on dolphins and two turtles. They did not have the boy on dolphins so they had to cut one of ours in half. And so now we have three replicas. The replicas are made out of cast aluminum but the bowls are still uh, cast iron, just as they were before, as is the wall. We'll flip back down here. Uh, you, that gives you some sense of how big this bowl is. And a better picture to give you some sense. They did a beautiful job. You cannot tell the difference between the old and the new. Well, I told you the old one had lights hanging from it because John was crazy about electricity. 
And about the only way they could figure out apparently how to light the fountain was to put light bulbs. So there are holes around the top uh, bowl and around, the, there's lights around the top of the column. And they back then apparently had just regular light bulbs powered by a 110. Same thing you have in your house today. Our experts kept saying there's no way somebody should have been electrocuted with it. So as they tried to recreate that for us, they came up with the idea of fiber optic. Fiber optics been used in other fountains around the country. But as I said, we are the only fountain with light bulbs hanging off of. So anything they did was, you know, the first time it has been done. It worked okay, kind of. Uh, and we can blame people from ever and ever, you know, the fiber was not laid exactly like it should have been. It was bent. Uh, you know, then one thing after another happened, they came over and they tried to fix it over and over. And at this very point now, the whole thing is down. So we have no lights on the upper part of the fountain. Clearly now what has to be done, we have to take the fiber optic out and install LED. This was something was not available back in 2017. These are our little turtles, all painted and ready. Again, some of them are real and some of them are replicas. This is the lady on the very top and there's a light bulb that goes right over her head. That will be there again, but this time it's gonna have to be an LED. Um, JL Mott it has a funny history. They, they weren't really into fountain making. The story goes, and I don't know if it's true or not, but the story is that one of their workmen took a urinal to an art show and people said, oh my, it's a piece of art, it's a piece of art. And so John, John, uh, J.L. Mott decided, oh, I must be an artist. So he started making fountains. And so he just kind of copied whatever he saw. They call this the lady rising or the lady with the, they just named it anything. It doesn't, none of the features really come from anything in particular. It's just what Mott did. Here she's had her first coat of epoxy, but she hasn't had her final coat. This is, you can see the detail in the wall, which was wonderful. And they, they put that back exactly what it was, again, from the original molds. So this is Ancon Construction, getting everything ready to install the renovated fountain. Uh, by now, it is uh, 2019. Uh, it certainly is different from the first picture you saw. Again, and some of the features are now in place. This was just about as exciting for me as you can get. And a view of the fountain in place. The water has yet to be turned on. Uh, you can see the little turtles all around and the boys on dolphins. And again, the light bulbs hanging from the top. And here is our fountain. Um, it looks great. The light bulbs, by the way, look like they're working better than they were. I kept calling our experts and I said, these light bulbs don't work. And then I'd send them a picture and they'd say, well, wait, it looks like it's working just fine. Well, finally, I found the Lighting Research Institute of America, who knew, in New York. And she must have talked to me for an hour and explained how camera, cameras can capture light that the naked eye simply cannot see. And that was what was happening to us. So uh, we live with that for quite a while. And as I said, Georgia Fountain and Light tries very hard to fix it but it was almost impossible.
uh, this is where, you know, we're always wanting money, of course. And so this is one of the places, uh, you know, you can contact me directly. You can go on Facebook. What I do want to tell you is WNIT did an amazing one-hour documentary. And it is John Studebaker, Gift of Light and Water. And you can pull that up anytime. It's beautiful. We sold bricks, but unfortunately, they're not really bricks. They're actually sandblasted into the cement. It's kind of blocked off as brick. So when we first started it, there were multiple companies that did that. Now, no one hardly. I finally found one company in St. Joe, Michigan. I've had an awful hard time getting the rest of these bricks engraved. Isn't it pretty? <laughs> <laughs> this is our fountain. <sighs> so to continue the story, the park department of the city did not install a water fountain or water softener when they put in the fountain. And it turns out that we sit on a lime, lime, what's it called? Hard water. Well, it's very hard water, but it's we the whole area sits on this lime deposit. And because the city was determined to use potable water, when our experts wanted to pull the water from the river, filter it, push it up, and push it right back in the river. But the city wanted to use city water. And of course, it wasn't two years before our features were all limed up, our lines were limed up, and we were in trouble there too. You can see the lime on the edge of the bowl. You can see it between the boy's fingers. It was so sad. So the fight was on again. And finally, the city agreed to install a softener if we, the committee, would pay for about half of it. We did. We just, I just keep raising money. I don't have any friends left. I just beg everybody. And uh, they had to sandblast or they use little glass beads to take it down to its very core again. Then it had to be repainted and restored completely each individual piece and put back. It is beautiful. It is so worth saving. And you who've done so much to restore things throughout your community and this state, you know how difficult it is and also how rewarding. Thank you all so very, very much for caring enough to listen. I'm gonna give it to Todd. Mm -hmm. Uh, Vicki demures, but she is a force to be reckoned with, and I do not believe for a minute that she does not have any friends left. Um, it's been an amazing uh, adventure with her, and as we all know, uh, it, it really takes that spark and that energy and that focus to to lead the band, and or in this case, lead the turtles to the fountain. Um, and it's been a remarkable story to be part of. And as you saw, not just save the fountain once, but twice, and maybe the third time with the, the soft water, which now it still looks beautiful. And I can just test to let you know, if you do come into town for the, the uh, conference at the end of September, I'd encourage you to stop by and you will see people down there all of the time. The vision for the committee was to bring a, an asset down to that park. You could do weddings and you know, events and receptions. And even outside that, there's always folks around that fountain. So it's become quite the community gathering spot, which is really back to its roots, which is what Studebaker uh, really envisioned um, with or without the uh, bench and the bars. So yeah, the last uh, thing there is Vicki mentioned, the last piece is just to continue to put this back together again with the lighting. Uh, and so we just put that uh, slide up there if you're so inclined, Studebaker dot studebakerfountain.org is the location in a variety of ways. If you're so inclined, I'd encourage you to think about that along with the you know, funds for ongoing uh, repair. So I think Suzanne, you've got um, some uh, questions that uh, we'd be glad to try and answer and uh, we'll let Vicki back on screen here. Sure, yeah, just a couple. And before I jump into the questions, I just wanna remind everybody that Aaron Perry from um, the South End Parks 
will be our keynote speaker for our dinner at the conference on Wednesday. And he'll be talking about uh, revitalization to all of South Bend's parks, historic parks. So uh, you want to join us for that. Uh, one question, uh, Vicki mentioned that she was told that this would be the largest Studebaker fountain when it was reconstructed. Um, are there other Studebaker fountains out there? If I said Studebaker fountain, I misspoke. The largest J.L. Mott fountain. And yes, there are J.L. Mott fountains all over the country. Uh, people will tell you, oh, we have one too. But when you get there, what they really have is that top part of it, or they have uh, the, the base is very plain, or they have the fountain. No one apparently that we know of has as much or as complete as this one. And we had another question from one of our friends in Woodruff Place in Indianapolis, which has a lot of uh, statuary and, and fountains. And they'd like to know what was the cost of the final cost of the fountain restoration, not including the installation. And of course, we know it's not really still final, but. Uh, well, it, let's see, we, we got up to 282,000. It went on up to five. I, I think we're close to a half a million dollars. I really do. It just kept eating eating more, you know. Uh, they cut the, the fiber too short. We had to have more fiber. They, um, they had to truck in more stuff. They, it, just, it just kept mounting. And by the way, I called when I had such trouble and, and want it, the water you know, problem, I called their fountain in Indianapolis and I talked to the guy and I guess they're having some buildup, but nobody had as hard a water as we do. Yeah, I have another question. Uh, do you know the height and the weight? Certainly don't know the weight or the, yeah, I don't know the weight. The height is 28 feet. The width is 42 feet. And all I could say is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and did that cause a lot of problems with the installation? I assume they brought in a crane or something. Oh, oh, we had to do a crane. And every time we repair anything, they have to take off the top to get to the, the wiring. or get, So we have to have a crane that lifts off the lady on top and then lifts off the top bowl. Are any of the lights working at this point? None of the globes are working. Okay. The lights in the fountain are working. Uh, what we did was try to put it back like it was in 1906, plus add all the new lighting that is so popular now, which is why it all changes color. So there is lights now. There are lights in the upper bowl, you know, that just, uh, I think there's two of those and three of them in the, in the bottom bowl and then lights around inside the wall and lights on the front. So there are a lot of those. So some of those are working. I don't know when you come into town, they are going to shut it down because they've also got a leak. <laughs> They're going to try to find the leak. Yeah. Um, our um, attendee from Wood Place said that, that Wood Place, the neighborhood has uh, multiple JL Mott fountains and they're fundraising to restore and they have one that is as large as the Studebaker. And really? she says that Luke Robinson is actually uh, in Indianapolis today to take some pieces to Alabama and restore them. So I'm sure uh, we can get the two of you together to commiserate. Well, and they have ideas. found the right company. Luke is wonderful. Great, great. Uh, another question. Do the city park planners finally appreciate the, the gym? after you begged them to Ask re it? Aaron Perry. I okay. think there was many times when he thought, oh my God. And I know that no one thought we could really raise that kind of money. Right. Uh, it had been tried before. Uh, two different people, I think Todd even knows about that, had tried before. I don't know how much energy they put in it. But, you know, nobody got as lucky as I did with just 75,000 arriving because. So, and once you get that kind of 
uh, beginning, then you become legitimate and other people are more likely to donate, but you know all of that. I have to tell you one funny story that we did have to change. So when we restored it and that we set it up and we got ready for our grand opening. Uh, so we were supposed to have the turtles facing the, the boys on dolphins. And so people were still trying to do a little research and found that when they had first turned on the fountain back in 1906, and apparently John was standing there and it was just grand, the turtles were facing out. So they turned it on, the turtles squirted all over the people <laughs> in their long dresses. <laughs> you know? So we thought, okay, we won't do that. <laughs> Do you have any idea of a timeline for the lights to be repaired? <laughs> they haven't even been able to agree how to do it. All right. I have, the city has pretty much given it, the work to us. And so I have two guys, a uh, lighting designer uh, who is working on it, but uh, it's not easy to find how you're gonna, so, LEDs are easy now, but where do you put all the ground faults? Where do you, what kind of bulbs will withstand and how do you wire for those that will go up there? So I'm afraid we have a problem. We'll get it done, but it, it's going to take a while apparently. And we have to pay for it. We, the committee, have to pay for it. Our experts apparently, according you know, it shouldn't have been uh, uh, fiber optic in the beginning, but by the same token, if not that, what? Well, if we've got any electrical engineers or wizards uh, attending, we hope you'll get in touch with uh, the oh, friends. Oh, Vicki would love to hear from you. We're struggling there. Yeah. We're really struggling. Uh, another, another Question. Um, chronologically, how does the fountain fit in with other contributions to South Bend by James Studebaker, uh, like in particular the Methodist Church? I don't know. Uh, huh? It was later. The fountain was later. Uh, Todd would know all that kind of stuff. I do know that unlike some of our other people, J.M. Studebaker left no money to to take care of the things that he had given. And so, you know, like, uh, uh, what's it? Kafja Home. Yeah, it has a, a fairly good basis of money. We didn't have anything. I even tried to call the Studebaker Foundation, but I don't think there is one hardly. <laughs> and then I tried to research how much money they had you know, my checking counts higher. So, <laughs> you know, they they were not a source of income for us at all. It was okay. simply the people who lived here. Sometimes I would get a check. In fact, I love telling the story. Our largest donation uh, was 125,000 and our smallest was $2 in an envelope that says, for fountain. Isn't that great? Yep. It, ta it takes a village and we know the fundraising never stops because it's so important to have a maintenance endowment too to take care of these. And we, we are doing the same. The city has guaranteed they'll take care of it, but. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Uh, <laughs> do you know how long the fountain was in the yard of the private home and also maybe how long it was at that little miniature golf course? I don't know about the golf course. I, I could look that up and I think you could probably research it. But if the fountain was torn down in 41 and they didn't, uh, they gave the fountain to the city, the pieces in 2009, that's how long Silers had it, had those pieces. Now, I didn't tell you there is one boy on a dolphin uh, in the backyard of a home on Jefferson Street uh, right now, still operating as a fountain. It's never been treated. It's never been, had anything done to it. Of course, I would have liked to have had that, but they weren't willing to give it up. Interesting. Well, uh, Glenda says, Vicki, you are an amazing trailblazer, and she'd like to know what your background is and uh, if you're in this for the duration of the project. 
I had no idea it was going to be my lifetime commitment. My friend talked me into it and she said, oh, you've retired. You, you, would you look at this project? I just can't get, seem to get it done. And I said, oh, sure. And that was what, 2017 and I'm still here. My background is criminal justice. I investigated homicides. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have no background in this kind of thing at all, but I've learned a lot. Just ask me something about water. It's craziness. <laughs> Great. Well, I, I'm uh, sure there will be other people out there that are interested in uh, learning about your expertise and everything that you've discovered along the way. And uh, so we can connect I, you. If anybody thinks they could help us, advise us, just wants to talk, May I leave my phone number? Maybe I should have put that up. It's 574-233-4445. We will also, if you'd like, uh, we'll include a, a link when we send out the recording. We'll send out a link to the Friends uh, website. We can send your email address. And then we'll also include a link to the video that you mentioned because it is it's wonderful and it goes into more detail about uh, a lot of the work that had to be done. Uh, let me see. I think we just got a couple more questions that popped up. Um, and uh, one said your background is why you were so tenacious in getting this project <laughs> done, which is very true. And uh, Karen wants to thank you for a great presentation and a great project. So any last questions or any, any last uh, comments from Todd and Vicki? Thank you so very much for caring enough to attend. I truly appreciate it. And I, of course, would love to hear from you. Well, thank you for everything that you've done. And again, get up to South Bend and see this for yourselves. And uh, we look forward to catching up with everybody in person at Preserving Historic Places. Thank you. Thank you. Do we leave? <laughs>